Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus and welcome. Welcome to the United Methodist Church of Westport and Weston. Welcome to those of you here and those on the live stream. Welcome to God's house and to being the people of God together. Welcome. It is good, good for us to be here together. Uh, if you are visiting this morning, I just remind there are some connection cards in the pew in front of you, uh, or if you ever have changes to any of your connection information, and if you have prayer requests, those blue cards there can do all of those things. You can place one in the offering plate when that time comes in worship. I uh, want to welcome this morning Reverend Karen Eiler, who is our guest preacher. I'm thrilled that Karen is here because she's a an excellent preacher, a wonderful friend, and for both of those reasons also is wonderfully agreed to preach this morning so that I didn't have to write a sermon while we were on vacation this week. So um, it's a joy for me to lead worship with Karen as we've done many times through the years. Uh, Karen wrote the little bio there that we uh, were classmates at YDS and friends through the ordination process and, and through our ministry together. So um, please join me in welcoming Karen this morning. A uh, reminder that Grace Connection continues today with Acts, the Revolution of Faith. So come and hear more about that. And um, yeah, I've heard it's exciting. So... <laughs> Um, and next Sunday at 11.30, we will have a ministry tables meeting, our quarterly meeting where all are welcome to gather and hear a report from the leadership team and also have an opportunity to be in conversation about upcoming ministries in the church. So that will be at 11.30 next Sunday. Are there any other announcements this morning? Well, let's just take a moment to breathe, to be present in the presence of God, to receive God's Holy Spirit, to put aside the distractions and worries of our day, and to be fully present to God. We prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to the prelude. Let us rise for the call to worship. Blessed are you, O God, full of faithfulness and steadfast love. How awesome are your deeds. How glorious is your name in all the earth. We celebrate who you are and what you have done for us. You hold our lives in your hands and keep our feet from stumbling. We've come together, led by the Holy Spirit, to sing your praise, to confess our failings, and to receive your forgiveness and love, made possible through the life-giving grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. To you be all glory, creator, redeemer, sustainer, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us raise our voices and sing. Thank you.
We come before God with our faults and our failings, knowing that God offers forgiveness and grace. Let us pray together. God of endless possibility, we confess that we do not always perceive the opportunities you place before us. Caught up in our own hopes, plans, and fantasies, and crushed when they disappoint us, we are slow to see the open pathways you set before us. Open our eyes that we may accept the new life you offer us, and thus show forth the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Beloved of God, by the resurrection power of God through Christ, we are freed from our sins and redirected on the path of new and abundant life. Thanks be to God. As forgiven and loved children of God, let us share the peace of Christ with one another. Peace be with you. And you can keep the picture up because the picture is gorgeous. So this is, um, I said I, I didn't do a sermon, but I certainly had some, had some thoughts and reflections this past week. So this is um, St. Chapelle Royal Chapel in Paris. It's on the same island where Notre Dame is. Um, I have many other pictures I can show you of this, <laughs> many other pictures overall, but many other pictures of this as well. So this chapel was built in 1248. Um, it was commissioned by King Louis the IX. I think. Go ahead and look it up and correct me if I'm wrong. But, um, and it, the purpose of the chapel was to hold the sacred relic of the crown of thorns of Christ. The tradition held that this was the crown of thorns. I don't know where they had been until 12... Um, 48, but that is the tradition. So they were held here. Then at some point they were moved to Notre Dame. Um, when the fire broke out five years ago at Notre Dame, they were rescued, as were many of the other relics. Um, and they are, the crown is currently at the Louvre. Uh, we didn't get to that section because there's way too much in the Louvre. But the, the point of St. Chapelle, or the, the, the fabulous part of it, is these stained glass windows. When you walk in, uh, I think we all kind of caught our breath and said, wow, when we came up those stairs. It starts, this is just the, the nave at the top, but starts further back with stories from Genesis and Exodus and moves all the way around with the life of Christ, I believe, somewhat in the middle, and then comes around to Acts, uh, stories of saints and the martyrs, and then the last piece is some of the stories of the relics, so things like the crown and others, and how they got there. And so each of these pieces, you know, is about this big and has one image from a story. So as we say, a picture has a thousand words, um, thousands and thousands of stories just in these stained glass windows alone. Which just got me thinking about the stories that we tell and how this was a way to tell stories for those who could not read. We then had Renaissance artwork and sculpture and you know, through the ages the church has found a way to tell the story. And certainly there are still religious artists but not to the same extent that we used to have. And just thinking about how it is that we tell the story of God. We each tell it in our own way, influenced by scripture and our experience and the traditions of the church and led by the Spirit. And you'll hear in the, the 
the uh, sermon today and the readings today about sort of a different, <laughs> Karen's like, yeah, you listened to what I said I was going to do, um, <laughs> about how, how even one episode can be told in two very different ways. So just as you hear this story today, as you reflect on other stories, as you reflect on your own life, Dennis keeps reminding us we all need to have a way to tell our story. And maybe you're not going to make stained glass. Most of us won't. But we all have a story to tell. And I was thinking of the hymn, Blessed Assurance. And this is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. Good morning, church. I am very glad to see all of you, very glad to be here with you. Um, I just shifted the flowers a little bit because I am not as tall as your usual preacher and I couldn't see over the flowers. I was missing this entire section of the, of the congregation, so hello over here as well. Would you please pray with me? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So I, I was so thrilled. Pastor Heather was listening when I told her what I was thinking about for today because we have two readings today and these two readings give us two views of what happened when Christianity came to Thessalonica. From the book of Acts written by Luke, we have the story of Paul's first visit to the city. The other view is from Paul's first letter to the church that he founded there. So the Pharisee and persecutor of Christians named Saul met the risen Christ in a vision, you know this story, on the road to Damascus, and he has become an enthusiastic, spirit-filled missionary named Paul, bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to communities of Jews and Gentiles around the Mediterranean. Our first reading today is from his second missionary journey. Paul and his companion Silas were recently jailed in Philippi for casting out a demon there, a demon who had been making, a, a demon who had been in a slave girl and had been making a lot of money for this slave girl's owners. An earthquake in the middle of the night, releases them from their shackles and their cell, but they stay where they are so that their jailer won't be executed, which is what would surely happen to him if they escaped. The jailer, very moved by this amazing generosity, listens to what Paul has to say, and he and his family are baptized. The authorities suddenly realize that Paul and Silas are Roman citizens, and throwing them in jail was a gigantic oops, and they want to let them go secretly. But Paul insists on a public apology because that's what he's like. Um, it's one of the keys to his popularity with, with um, people in authority. So this gives us an idea of how Paul's ministry is generally received by those in power. Paul and Silas head next to Thessalonica, the capital of the Roman province of Macedonia. It's on the coast of Greece, north of Athens. It's still the second largest city in Greece today. Before we hear this reading, it's important to understand that Paul's audience in the synagogue would have been not just Jewish people, but also Gentiles who were called God-fearers. They had not converted to Judaism, but they believed in the one God that Jews were worshiping. And also the Jason, who will be mentioned in this reading as hosting Paul and Silas, is one of those Gentiles. 
Pastor Heather is reading from Acts chapter 17. Paul and Silas took the road south through Annapolis and Apollia to Thessalonica, where there was a community of Jews. Paul went to their meeting place as he usually did when he came to a town, and for three Sabbaths running, he preached to them from the scriptures. He opened up the text so that they understood what they'd been reading all their lives, that the Messiah absolutely had to be put to death and raised from the dead. There were no other options, and that this Jesus I'm introducing you to is that Messiah. Some of them were won over and joined ranks with Paul and Silas, among them a great many God-fearing Greeks and a considerable number of women from the aristocrat. But the hard-line Jews became furious over the conversations. Mad with jealousy, they rounded up a bunch of brawlers off the street and soon had an ugly mob terrorizing the city as they hunted down Paul and Silas. They broke into Jason's house, thinking that Paul and Silas were there. When they couldn't find them, they collared Jason and his friends instead and dragged them before the city leaders, yelling in a frenzy, These people are out to destroy the world, and now they're showing up on our doorstep, attacking everything we hold dear, and Jason is hiding them. These traitors and turncoats who say Jesus is king and Caesar is nothing. The city leaders and the crowd of people were totally alarmed by what they heard. They made Jason and his friends post heavy bail and let them go while they investigated the charges. What happens here and in Philippi before this and in other places before that is essentially political, not theological. Neither of these is the first time Paul and company have been driven out of cities and towns by Jewish authorities who are jealous of the attention that the gospel is getting, and it won't be the last. They use the same argument that, that was against Paul. They're using the same argument that was used against Jesus, that he, that he is telling people that Caesar has competition. Jesus is perceived, then, as a political threat to the order of the Roman Empire, despite the fact that he's no longer on earth and is another kind of ruler entirely. These details are completely irrelevant to the ruckus makers. Paul will briefly return to Thessalonica in about seven years on his third missionary journey. But shortly after his first visit, he writes them a letter. This was in the early 50s, making it the earliest writing in all of the Christian scriptures. In this letter, Paul encourages his friends in the face of the oppression they're experiencing. And he emphasizes the need to make holy choices. He defends his own character and motives, which apparently some people are questioning. The letter also talks about Christ's return, which Paul says is happening very soon, any minute now. He will correct this. I mean, it's been 2,000 years, right? He will correct this in his next letter, saying that actually it might be a while and it's going to be a struggle. I'm going to be reading the entire first chapter of this first letter. It's only 10 verses long. I, Paul, here together with Silas and Timothy, send greetings to the church at Thessalonica, Christians assembled by God and by the Master Jesus Christ, God's amazing grace be with you and God's robust peace. Every time we think of you, we thank God for you. Day and night, you're in our prayers as we call to mind your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope in following our master, Jesus Christ, before God. It is clear to us, friends, that God not only loves you very much, but also has chosen you for something special. When the message we preached came to you, it wasn't just words. Something happened in you. The Holy Spirit put steel in your convictions. 
you paid careful attention to the way we lived among you and determined to live that way yourselves. In imitating us, you imitated the master. Although great trouble accompanied the word, you were able to take great joy from the Holy Spirit, taking the trouble with the joy, the joy with the trouble. Do you know that all over the provinces of both Macedonia and Achaia, believers look up to you? The word has gotten around. Your lives are echoing the master's word, not only in the provinces, but all over the place. The news of your faith in God is out. We don't even have to say anything anymore. You are the message. People come up and tell us how you received us with open arms, how you deserted the dead idols of your old life so you could embrace and serve God, the true God. They marvel at how expectantly you wait for the arrival of God's Son, whom God raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescued us from certain doom. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Think about this for a minute. This is a pretty surprising outcome from Paul's three weeks or so in Thessalonica. The new Christians there, both Jew and Gentile, are on fire for Christ, full of the Holy Spirit. Despite being persecuted, they have become an example of faith to all those around. Paul remembers with gratitude how he was treated there. Does this strike you as strange, given what we learned from our reading in Acts about how Paul was treated in Thessalonica? Paul has chosen to remember the faithful ones, the Gentiles and Jews who were convinced that Jesus is the Messiah, God's anointed one. He focuses on the ones who were able to embrace the idea of a heavenly king who would voluntarily sacrifice himself for the sake of others, as Jesus Christ has done. Paul has chosen to leave the opposition completely out of his story. He leaves out the jealous leaders and the mercenary rioters who turned the city upside down. He leaves out the ones who went to his friend Jason's house and who had Jason arrested when they couldn't find Paul. He leaves out the fact that they had to sneak out of the city that very night under cover of darkness to save their own lives. Paul is deliberately choosing to tell a story about Thessalonica that encourages faith and trust in God and perseverance in the, faith of, in the face of hardship. At the end of the preface to his novel, The Gates of the Forest, Elie Wiesel writes, God made humans because God loves stories. We humans are storytellers. Stories are how we make sense of the world around us and within us. Though our stories are unlikely to end up in scripture, like Paul's did, the choices we make about the stories we tell are still very important because our stories build our lives. All day, every day, we are presented with a series of facts and happenings and developments. To be able to function, we have to make sense of these things. We do that by arranging these facts and happenings and developments into stories. The way we do this affects how we feel, how we treat others, and how we interact with the world. I pull my stories about the world together by focusing on the choices I can make and what I can influence, knowing that I am a very small part of a very complex whole. I seek out reliable information on the issues that mean the most to me. I connect with others who care about the same issues. And I try, as best I can, to approach people and situations, especially ones that are unfamiliar and scary, with curiosity and kindness. By doing this to the best of my ability, I try to live out a story that says God's creation, the world and the people in it, are fundamentally good, even if some of the people seem to be tragically mistaken about some things. 
the choices we make in telling our stories make a difference on a smaller scale, too. If you'll allow me a personal example, I have cancer in a lot of places in my body, like from here to here, approximately, and my long-term prospects are not particularly rosy. Something hurts almost all the time. There are a lot of things I can't do anymore. Two weeks out of three, I lose a couple of days to chemotherapy. I could take these facts and tell you a story that would depress us all, but I choose not to do that. Instead, let me tell you how miraculous my life is. For one thing, I am standing here with you today. Thank you. That chemotherapy that's taking two days a week is keeping me alive for now. When I couldn't climb the stairs in my home anymore, the perfect home came right to me. It's comfortable and pretty, and there are birds everywhere. There's even a sunny, accessible spot for my herb garden, and my friends helped me move. I don't drink alcohol anymore. It's bad for people with cancer. And I mostly avoid sweets and meat. But I tell you, vegetables and fruit, grains and beans, fish and nuts are delicious. They're really delicious. I get very excited about eating meals. And also, super dark chocolate doesn't have very much sugar in it. <laughs> I have so much to look forward to. My granddaughter will be a year old next week. For the second year in a row, one of my children is getting married. At last year's wedding, I wore shoulder-to-toe sequins and a fabulous hat. Who knows what, what will happen this year? Friends and family from across the street and around the country come to visit me. My doctors and nurses and therapists are smart and wise, diligent and careful, caring and kind. My family and friends are proof of God's grace because I could never deserve how good they are to me. I am not eager to leave this life because it's beautiful, but I trust that what waits beyond it is good. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times when I feel deeply sorry for myself. It is not a pretty picture. But I try not to stay there long. And the surest way out of any hole that I dig myself into is to stop and check what story I am telling myself. Is it a story about what I'm missing? Oh, poor me. Or is it a story about the amazing blessings I have? I mean, I could tell you about this stuff all day long. I mean, don't get me started. It's, my life is amazing. And I recognize that many lives are harder than mine. Even in my worst, scariest, most painful moments, I have always been able to find at least one thing to be grateful for. But I don't want to be so arrogant as to assume that that is true for everyone, or that it will always be true for me. Even so, I believe that no matter how bad things get, God will always be with me. I will always have access to God's love, and I can be grateful for that. Do you believe that too? That no matter how bad things get, God is always with you. Now things got pretty bad for Paul in the end. Jailings and beatings and being run out of town were not the worst of it. He was finally deported to Rome and executed because he was a Christian. To the very end, he continued to tell the story of God's love for him and everyone, God's love for everyone in Jesus Christ. And that story is unstoppable. What story will you choose to tell? Amen. Amen. And now let's invite the Holy Spirit to fill us with love, joy, confidence, and peace. Would you please join me in hymn number 2117 in the faith we sing, Spirit of God. We'll sing verses 1, 4, and 5. You may remain seated.
gifts come from you. Along with our church's food and clothing drives, prepared meals for those in need, the many hands helping refugee resettlements through Siri and home bills through Habitat, we joyfully bring our tithes and offerings to your altar so that your good work on earth continues. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come into our time of prayer, I know there may be stories you have to tell uh, and prayers to lift up. I think prayers in many ways are the stories that we tell to God, the way that we stay in conversation with God. So are there are people that we are thinking of today and praying for today that you want to lift up? I'd like to wish Stephen a very happy birthday today. Happy birthday, Stephen. <laughs> Only Aunt Kim could do that, right? <laughs> Happy birthday, Stephen, and thank you for all the gifts that you bring to us. And it's Dan Gelman's birthday, too, as well. So if you send Dan a happy birthday wish. Are there others? Hey, Paula. are to all of us. You are just amazing. Um, God works through you for sure. And Karen, you're on our weekly prayer list that goes out every week, so um, we are always praying for you and continue to do so. so. Keep up the good work, y'all. All right. <laughs> we will. We will. Uh, oh, sorry. So I don't want to cloud this with bad news, but it's bad news um, for the community garden. Mm -hmm. the, um, the next committee voted with the, um, voted with the plan to literally close the garden. So it's not looking good. That was the Parks and Rec who voted with the building committee. So then, of course, now it's the finance and all of that. But this will be most likely the last year of uh, the community garden. Yeah. Thank you for the update. We're, we're praying with and for you that as a community, we can find a way forward and not and and for our earth as well as earth day is tomorrow is that right it's tomorrow as we celebrate our earth and all of creation may we find ways to appreciate it and not to shut ourselves out So also beginning this week is General Conference of the United Methodist Church. Some of you have probably been keeping up on that. Others have not. Um, there's, there's lots to read. And um, basically, this is the postponed General Conference that was supposed to take place in 2020. Uh, so we have the same delegates that were in 2020. In 2020, we thought we would do it, and then we couldn't, and it delayed and delayed, and finally, 2024. Um, so, delegates and bishops, observers and workers and volunteers are gathering from around the world in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, they'll be gathering for 10 days. It's 10 days, isn't it? It's a long time. Um, they'll be gathering for 10 days to, to work and to worship and to make some big decisions for the denomination. Um, there have been a lot of proposed budget cuts. There are proposed changes to how we're organized as a church. There are proposed changes to the Book of Discipline. Um, maybe by next week I'll have a little bit more to offer as where the work is, and certainly by the, the following week. And then there'll still be things to fall out as we go. Um, but I just ask for your prayers for all of those who are traveling. Um, Karen and I have some dear friends and colleagues who will be there. Um, you may know people. Bishop Bickerton, of course, will be there. Um, 
but just prayers for, for listening, for discernment, for hearing God's voice and the movement of the Holy Spirit, and that, that the story we tell when, that when people have left that place is that we are a church of, of love and of caring um, and of inclusion of all of God's children. And so uh, the prayer I have for us this morning is just a prayer for, for that general conference. And, and I'll be sending out some things during the week to, to help you focus your prayers as well. Let us pray. Oh God, you hear the prayers that are on our hearts. You know our joys and our sorrows, our struggles and our victories. You guide us through our stories. And we pray that it is your story that would shine most brightly in our lives. We pray for those who celebrate this day. We pray for those who grieve. We pray for those who are seeking healing and hope. We pray this week for the church, for the church universal and for, in particular, the United Methodist Church. We pray for general conference delegates, for bishops and workers, volunteers and observers who will gather from around the world to join in the work of kingdom building through the United Methodist Church. They will bring a diversity of cultures and languages, experiences and expectations that will influence their work. Though they may not be of one mind, may they be of one heart for your glory. God of wisdom, we pray for guidance. We pray for the United Methodist Church and its local churches, leaders, and ministries in the holy work of making and growing and nurturing disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We pray that the conference may do no harm and seek to heal the brokenness that has harmed in the past. We pray for the connection and its commitment to have open hearts, open minds, and open doors. God of grace, we pray for unity. We pray that the work of the General Conference will be faithful to the commandment to love and be the example of Jesus Christ. And may their actions be a testament to the transformative power of God's inclusive love in a broken and divided world. God of love, we pray your will be done. We pray for conferences and churches, for clergy and laity as we wait for the decisions that will be made. May we prepare our hearts and spirits to continue the good work set before us, the call to share the gospel, the commitment to make and grow and nurture disciples for the transformation of the world. We pray for this congregation and community as we explore new paths and seek to face the future unafraid. God of new beginnings, give us hope and strength in the name of the risen Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us rise to sing. The Spirit sends us forth to serve. 